Hi, Master Hong. Can we just quickly go over how to say my name so that's not sure it's Tikwani. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, all right. Well, I think we are, are live on Facebook now and we're recording. So let's uh, get started. We got a lot to do. Um, thank you so much for, for logging in or for uh, watching on, on your computer um, on Facebook. We, uh, this is actually a really timely conversation about why Utah needs to invest in permanent supportive housing. Um, this is timely for three reasons. One is uh, that our state um, has heard that we're likely our waiver to integrate Medicaid services uh, into housing services to, to um, provide housing related services to people who are coming out of homelessness um, is likely to be approved at the beginning of next year, which means next month. Uh, or the month after that. Um, at the same time, we had an audit of homeless services that suggests that permanent supportive housing is, is not as effective as it, as it should be. Um, and there were serious problems with that audit, which we'll talk about. The uh, last reason this is timely is because the state legislature starts meeting next month and there is a proposal uh, there will be proposals to put significant funding up to $200 million or even more uh, in American Rescue Plan Act funding into affordable housing, including really targeted affordable housing um, for like permanent supportive housing. And so uh, my name is Bill Tibbetts. I'm the deputy executive director at Crossroads Urban Center. And I can't believe the amazing people who've agreed to participate in this conversation. I'm so Grateful for all of you. And our, our first uh, speaker is uh, Tara Rollins from the Utah Housing Coalition, who uh, has agreed to, to share more about the appropriation request made for the session and the way that the state funding, the role state funding plays in uh, making affordable housing projects possible in the state. Uh, so um, thank you, Tara. Thank you very much. Um, I need to, it says your screen sharing is paused. So if I could um, get the ability to share my screen, that would be great. Um, I am not sure what's happening with that. Oh, there, oh. It says I'm sharing, but I don't see it. Uh, we see it, Tara. I, I mean, I see it on my okay. screen. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Tara Rollins and I work for the Utah Housing Coalition and I can't see my presentation. So um, bear with me while I find it. How did I find it? Can you see it now? I can see it. Oh, awesome, okay. Why is it important for us to invest um, $200 million um, into our community? I always say into our community because that's what it's all about. Um, and so in terms of the audit, um, the audit I was very disappointed in because it, it was saying that people were staying too long in permanent supportive housing. The word permanent should say something. Um, and so, it's very important that we have housing first in a place where we have permanent supportive housing so people can get um, their care that they need and when they need it. Um, and as well as become, you know, part of that community in that building. 
And so um, as well as some people will move on um, to um, other housing. So, um, you know, I encourage everyone to really look at really what the definition of this is. Um, and so quickly, I wanted to debunk the cost the state has put into these projects because, you know, during the audit, they talked about how much Magnolia cost. And so I just wanted to go through the project and, um, and the reality of it. And so it was 65 studio units and it was targeted um, for the homeless population. And so the cost of Magnolia was roughly, um, you know, $15 million. And it came out to be around $230 um, per unit. And so um, when you really look at who invested in it, you know, we had Salt Lake City funds, we had 1 million of Only Walker, which is state funds. The 1 million um, other million that came out of Only Walker is federal funds and that's the National Housing Trust Fund. And then you had home dollars. Um, I put this out and then the biggest portion was private funding. Um, and so really why, is housing so costly? Well, it's expensive right now, very expensive. And also to compete in tax credits, you need to have certain elements in your project. You know, after tax reform, tax credits went down in value, cost of construction, and also Davis-Bacon. If you're using federal funds, um, you need to follow certain prototypes and pay in trade workers um, is very expensive in um, Davis-Bacon. So I really wanted to point out the cost savings. Um, you know, when you look at the cities and states cost, if we don't get people housed, you know, we have encampment cleanup and other expenses through the health departments, you know, cities cleanup, fire, police, jail, the mayor's time and upper management time and designates and full-time staff. You know, state, we look at the unified funding. If we weren't using so much money um, in, services, um, we could actually do ca more case management and have people be more successful. And also I wanna point out prison costs. Um, okay, and then the private sector. Um, the cost is, you know, the stress in the community, you know, break-ins, theft, private property, trash. Um, ambulance being used as taxis to emergency rooms, emergency rooms excessively used, disruption to businesses. These are just a few right off the top of my head. Um, so another project, oh, the project that um, we're talking about right now, they put a million dollars in. And so what does that cost per unit? That's only $15,000 a unit the state invested in this particular project. And so I think it's fair to say that that is a very good investment per unit for the state. Also want to point out Pamela's place, you know, same target population, there's a hundred studio units and the cost um, we're thinking, um, cause I don't believe the state has the final cost. So just want to point that out um, that it's almost 13 million and the per unit was um, less. Um, and so when you look at, once again, private sector brought most of the money to the table. Um, and then only Walker, the state funds, it was only $823,000. And so what that equates to is um, $8,000 a unit, which is another incredible investment um, for the state. Um, and so, you know, examples of PSH in Salt Lake County, there's, um, I just chose nine to look at, um, and I just wanna point out how well-maintained they are and managed extremely well uh, by our community partners. And um, that's my portion. And I believe if we were able to invest, um, you know, funding in permanent supportive housing, we would be able to um, get many people off the street. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. That was incredibly uh, concise for the amount of information you presented. That was great. Um, I, uh, I think it's important as we talk about permanent supportive housing to point out that it is housing specifically for chronically homeless people, which HUD defines as people with disabilities who've been homeless for at least 12 months or four times in, in the past three years. So it's this is... Um, this isn't housing for just anyone. It is um, 
And uh, that is actually uh, leads into our next uh, presenter, uh, Sherry Whitwer, who in talking to her last week and in preparation for this event, said something I thought was really interesting, which was that she used to identify uh, as a mental health advocate and she became a housing advocate because she realized that so often the most needed uh, service, the most needed healthcare for people was, was, was stable housing for people with mental illness. And so I, um, one, one question I was hoping uh, some of our panelists would think about or address today is, is, should we actually stop talking about permanent supportive housing as being a homeless service and instead talk about it as a service for people with, with mental health issues and, and, and other disabilities? Um, and so I will let uh, Sherry talk because she knows a lot about this and we're so lucky to have her uh, with us today. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm happy to be here uh, today. I am Sherry Whitwer. I have worked in the mental health system in a variety of capacities, but I have always been a mental health advocate. Through my work and in my opportunity to be informed by people with lived experience, I have become a housing advocate. And the fact is housing is health care. And there is simply not a more critical need for individuals living with serious mental illness than having access to safe, affordable, decent housing with the necessary supports for them to stay housed. This is permanent supportive housing. Um, over the years, supportive housing is shown to not only improve outcomes, but reduce healthcare costs when provided to those individuals who have com complex needs. When someone stays long-term in housing, that is the desired outcome. It shows the model is working. Our public systems and community providers are very familiar with the challenges of individuals who cycle through facilities and systems repeatedly. And while we've made some great progress in the development of crisis response systems, we have much work to do on preventing crisis from happening in the first place. Too often, the only, dis only solution that is discussed is to build more psychiatric beds and facilities. Yet, for the cost of one night in a psychiatric facility or similar levels of care, we could pay the rent for an individual for about a month. And when people are discharged from these settings but do not have housing, any therapeutic gains the person may have received are lost. And in fact, they may have been further traumatized from the experience. We can put people in restrictive levels of care for a time, but nothing fundamentally changes about their life circumstances. They return to living on the street or in otherwise unsafe or inadequate conditions without their basic needs being met let alone the, have the ability to access effective mental health treatments. We need to change our mindset from beds to housing units. Permanent supportive housing coupled with access to evidence-based mental health services, such as peer support, assertive community treatment or ACT teams, and reliable and effective case management services can provide the highest level of community-based community care for individuals who are at risk of cycling through multiple systems or who are at risk for institutionalization. The social determinants of health are the non-medical factors that influence health and mental health outcomes. They include the basic necessities of life. Safety and housing are important components of the social determinants of health. And permanent supportive housing is where people go to live not to be contained. When people have stable housing, they can then focus on the activities of living, jobs, education, health and mental health, relationships, community and social connection, the things all of us want. If we want to truly help people living with serious mental illness, and if we want sound policy solutions that will reduce the burden on our homeless services system, law enforcement and first responders, courts, corrections, and emergency rooms, we must first look to housing. 
when we provide a variety of housing options with services and supports based on individual needs, we will break the cycle and be able to provide quality, cost-effective solutions that focus on the individual's long-term stability, independence, development, and dignity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. That was amazing. Um, I should remind, not everybody was here when I talked about this earlier. My coworker, Audrey Mancini, has agreed to do timekeeping. So we're hoping to leave some time for questions. So if you hit um, three minutes, Audrey, there will be a little hand on Audrey's um, square in the corner. Um, the next person who, who has agreed to share, uh, to talk with us is um, Taquani Oliver who is a um, member of the, Dis the Disabled Rights Action Committee and is uh, agreed to talk about how supportive housing um, is a mental health service. So I uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, one of the things that I can say as someone who has been unsheltered and who had a very late in life diagnosis of their own um, mental health disorder, I was diagnosed autistic uh, about four years ago, and it's become quite a, uh, it's become quite blat uh, blatantly aware to me um, how little accommodations for that disability are made within the mental health field, and one of those being available housing, supportive housing, and you know we we hear a lot of the cost associated with supportive housing, but we forget that if we can have supportive housing, we're employing case managers to help individuals like myself um, to get themselves to a place of independence or interdependence within a community. Now, for example, with Disability Rights Action Committee, we have we work with a grant program through the state called the New Choices Waiver, where a part of our program, the, the case management, is to get people who are in um, facilities into independent housing. Um, and, and ex But the thing is, the scope of even that program is limited. And so if we could expand housing as an accommodation that's needed, especially for neurodivergent folks, um, especially for folks who've had persistent um, housing insecurity and have trauma when it comes to being housed or sheltered, um, to be able to meet the individual needs of those people rather than um, put them in these, these monoliths of, well, this will work with one people and this won't work because not everyone will need permanent supportive housing. I know for myself, um, I had some pretty supportive housing taken care of for the last two years. And in that I was able to get my own case management and now I am in more independent housing situation. And those things wouldn't have been possible. Um, I am in emergency rooms less often. Um, I do have a community of support who help in, in, uh, inform me of the things that I wasn't aware of, especially being a person of color. You don't have a lot of access to healthcare um, as a younger person. And so there's a lot of things about my own healthcare, about my own health management practices that I'm having to learn. Because when you're poor, when you're a person of color, when you're neurodivergent, there are a lot of barriers to getting just basic access to basic healthcare. And for the first time I've had healthcare for two years. And if you give access to those resources and make it accessible, make it um, where you can navigate those resources, people will use them. It's that it becomes so complicated and inaccessible for folks like ourselves um, that it needs to become an accommodation that is covered by Medicaid and the resources are there. Thank you so much. That was, I thank you. Um, we have uh, some, okay. So our next person who has agreed to show up and, and present is, is um, 
Andrew Riggle from the Disability Law Center, who um, is, has agreed to talk about why it's problematic to stigmatize people with mental issue, health issues for needing help for more than a short term crisis. Um, I think that relates to why so many of us were concerned about the audit. Thank, thank you so much, Andrew, for agreeing to, to help with this. Um, can, let's see. I got it. <laughs> there we, caught me off guard. Thanks, Bill. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to join uh, to join you all today. Um, unfortunately, instead of listening to the voices of those with lived experience, bolstering case management and building on proven practices in other states, Utah has decided to follow the lead of the medical and legal establishments. Consequently, while the state invests heavily in beds and facilities, the number of individuals in our expanded civil commitment system with nowhere to go continues to increase. While the, while the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health mentions the housing crisis uh, in its block grant application, there is no plan to find appropriate and safe housing for individuals with serious mental illness or co-occurring substance use disorder. While recovery residences may be important to the continuum, there needs to be a focus on long-term housing first. There are a variety of housing options and supports that can be utilized to find long-term integrated solutions for persons affected by mental illness in the community. There need to be choices which enable individuals to choose the housing which best fits their needs. Therefore, the state must focus on, on the development of housing which is physically accessible, deeply affordable, and does not segregate residents with mental illness from the larger community. Uh, we are we are happy to share a couple examples if there's interest. The recent audit of the state's homeless service system suggests three res three reasons residents remain in permanent supportive housing. Be uh, the first one is because they refuse to address their mental illness or substance abuse. Uh, they are unable to they are unable to attain self sufficiency. The second hypothesis is that they enjoy a sense of community. And the third one is that they are unable to, um, that they are unable to find um, subsidized housing in the community. While the last two explanations get to the core of the real issue driving today's conversation, the lack of deeply affordable housing, the first, the first one demonstrates a fundamental misunderstanding of the need of the nature of, ser of serious mental illness or substance use. The medical establishment likes to think of most illness or disease as short term incurable. When a patient is cured, they are recovered. However, the same paradigm doesn't usually work for serious mental illness or substance use disorder. In this realm, recovery generally refers refers to the lifelong process of managing one's illness or disease and the, and the expected ups and downs that come with it. There is no such thing as cured. If we limit ourselves to the medical understanding of recovery, we run the, uh, we run the risk as the audit's first recommendation, first explanation does of blaming a person for their, for their perceived failure rather than the system for its actual for its actual failure to pro to provide adequate supports and resources sadly this seems to be the default response more often than not because it's easy because it's easier and less costly to ignore a person than it is to fix a problem ultimately it's simple utah must take responsibility for closing the revolving door of hospitalization or incarceration by investing in alternatives beyond suicide prevention and crisis stabilization. Thank you so much, Andrew. I, I think, um, I mean, I think it's, um, it's just with population growth, with uh, raising rents, it's just, it is completely foreseeable 
that the number of people with serious mental illness who can't afford to live independently is going to increase. Um, and so it is really short-sighted um, to, to say that uh, the permanent supportive housing is failing because it's keeping people in homes. That's what it's for. Um, our next uh, presenter is, is Nathan Cripps, who is also from the Disability Law Center, who has agreed to talk about why we need, uh, why it's important uh, for the state to uh, invest in permanent supportive housing still, despite the audit um, and the why, which is why it's important that there's uh, has been talk from the Housing Affordability Commission or the Commission on Housing Affordability is actually um, to to put two hundred million dollars toward affordable housing with the state's American Rescue Plan Act fund. So, I'll, uh, Nathan, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, I, I appreciate it. My name is Nate Kripis. I'm uh, the public affairs supervising attorney with the, the Disability Law Center. Um, as I was uh, trying to prepare for this um, late yesterday, because I'm very on top of things and I prepare for things very early, um, uh, I um, I was reading through the audit again and, and trying to you know come up with some thoughts, and um, I became frustrated, um, which then turned into me having to bug Andrew late in the day um, to talk through it, my frustrations, um, which I will just say, Andrew is the best person ever. If you're frustrated and you need to go through something, call Andrew. Um, I, I'm going to say that. I know Sherry knows that. Um, so. Um, so when we were talking through it, one of the things uh, I noticed is that the, the audit notes on, on many occasions, or at least a couple of occasions, that many in the chronically uh, homeless population have mental health needs or substance use. Um, but then it goes on to recommend that the, the Homelessness Council decide whether the goal of permanent supportive housing um, is to provide housing um, or to help individuals become self-sufficient. Um, and this is because individuals, uh, many of them with mental illness and substance use, remain in the housing and provided and, and, and don't seek treatment. Um, they go on to say that in order to help folks become self-sufficient, there would need to be additional supports. Um, in fact, there was some, some language I found interesting. It was, if the council chooses to focus on helping people become self-sufficient, uh, wait, no, sorry, that's the wrong quote. Um, uh, if the, helping people progress towards self-sufficiency is a primary objective, um, the council then, uh, they will need to strengthen case management, develop better assessment tools to identify client needs, and provide additional treatment for mental illness and substance use. So they acknowledge this. Um, and they kind of point out the very thing um, that is needed. Um, but but the, the, the frustrating thing about that is um, they, they think that um, providing housing and helping folks become self-sufficient are at odds. Um, as my colleague Andrew just kind of detailed in, I think, uh, very well, um, you know, that many of these individuals have long-term needs. Um, and that's going to include housing uh, with additional supports. Um, and so they, they kind of don't put those two together. Um, and I think part of that comes from the fact that, you know, the, the, the council and, and the coordinator are housed in the Department of Workforce Services. Um, you know, there doesn't appear to be a lot of coordination with, like, say, the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Uh, I, in fact, to my knowledge, I looked through the report, I don't believe that they're even mentioned once, um, that there is another state division that, that um, actually has, again, I'm not here to tell you the, the, the division is, is perfect um, and they get everything right, but I mean, they're, they're, they understand um, at least this population. Um, and, and honestly, Andrew and I uh, were actually just talking to a couple of mental health professionals who, who are pretty involved in the policy world. Um, and, and they, you know, they were completely unaware of this audit that it even existed. Um, and so I think, you know, part of the problem is that there isn't really any coordination with folks who understand treatment um, or the long-term needs of individuals with mental illness and substance use. And I think if there was, the audit may have recognized that the idea of providing housing and self-sufficiency actually go uh, together. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, the state can't simply, um, you know, just ignore the need for more supportive, permanent supportive housing. Um, the focus cannot be, as it, as it really has been, a focus on brick and mortar facilities, um, whether it's a crisis receiving center or more inpatient institutional beds. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a fundamental need for robust community-based services and supports, um, um, system, a, a system for, for youth and mental illness, and, and that's necessarily going to include um, permanent supportive housing. Um, you, know, you know, from our perspective, also, I will just add, you know, that the state has an obligation under uh, the integration mandate of the ADA to serve folks in the most integrated setting appropriate to their needs. Um, you know, we need a robust system of community-based services and supports designed to ensure individuals with mental health needs have the chance to be active, productive members of their communities um, while preventing or delaying the need for higher levels of care, institutionalization, or incarceration. Um, and so, I, you know, I just think that when we're talking about the need for 
permanent supportive housing, you know, we, it really is something, um, as I think Bill pointed out at the beginning, that we really should be focusing on, um, you know, making this a conversation about um, uh, mental health and less about homelessness. I, I think Bill was absolutely right on that point. Yeah, and thank you, Nathan, and I, I or and Nate, and I, I think that this is actually, I mean, given the fact that we're about to be given permission to do to integrate Medicaid healthcare, use Medicaid funding to integrate healthcare services with with uh, services in permanent supportive housing, it really is the time to say, okay, how do we do that? And if we do do it, does permanent supportive housing fit more into the healthcare? box rather than in the homeless services box. I, I think um, that's because you do things a little differently if you're focused on healthcare outcomes rather than on, are we freeing up beds at the shelter outcomes? Um, but I, our, our, we have, I thank you all so much for being part of this, this discussion. We have two more presenters and I, I noticed that there are a couple attendees uh, fr from the media. so. Um, if, if you're interested in, if, they're, if, they, if, if somebody in the audience is interested in, in asking a question, let us know and, and we will, uh, after the last two presenters, we'll, we will uh, set you up as a presenter so you can, you can uh, log in and ask a question. Um, so our next presenter is, is Andrea Beatles, who's from the Weber Housing Authority, um, who has agreed to talk about you know, the fact that there are people with mental illness, long-term uh, mental illness in Weber County and, and why it's important that people all over the state have a place that they can, when they have a place they can move, if they are, can no longer be supported by family or they never had family support, that they can move into supportive housing in the community where they live. Um, because I, I think um, Salt Lake County has, has built a fair amount of permanent supportive housing. There's still we still need another 450 units, but um, ideally this, this is a type of housing stock that would be built statewide. So um, thank you so much, Andrea, for, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanna thank the panelists um, and uh, especially to Connie, thanks for sharing your story. Um, what we know is the permanent supportive housing works. Um, so I'll just speak a little bit about the unique needs of Weber County. So currently there are only 50 beds for our entire county, um, PSH beds, 50 PSH beds. Um, and there are currently three times the number of households on the coordinated entry um, prioritization list. So individuals that are slated for um, permanent supportive housing beds. Um, additional beds are desperately needed to address the chronically homeless issues in our county. Um, we know that, like I said, PSH works. We know that this rental assistance coupled with case management um, leads to successful outcomes. Um, I just wanna share a quick story about a PSH consumer that we had on our program. This was an individual, um, in, she was 60 years old. She was a longtime Ogden resident. She had been on the streets for over 10 years. Um, she was substance use dependent and severely mentally ill. Um, Weber Housing Authority housed her. She, um, prior to being housed, she had had interactions on a weekly basis with Ogden Police, with the Ogden Police Department. Um, we, um, we got her housed, like I said, we housed her three times before she was successful on the program. On the third time that we, that she was housed, um, and she was able to then remain stably housed. Uh, we went to our annual point in time count, which is where we do our um, census of the homeless population that are residing on um, the streets and in places not meant for human habitation. And one of the officers made the comment, um, they had asked if she was dead, if um, they, that they hadn't seen her um, for, almost, uh, for almost nine months, which is the exact amount of time that we had had her housed. Um, and they had said, we assumed um, that she was dead um, because we had not seen her um, and arrested her on the streets. I think that that story, um, and then she remained, she has since passed away, but she remained successfully on the program. She was then able to address her substance use um, disorder and she was able to be self-sufficient. Um, now, obviously this isn't uh, the case with all um, 
PSH uh, individuals, but this is a huge success in our community for an individual that all of our service providers knew this individual had had encounters, usually negative encounters. Um, and then, and like I said, the police knew her intimately. She was arrested or had police interactions on a weekly basis. And so for her to be then um, housed, um, the savings that we had um, for in our community just by housing her um, were just incredible. Um, I just, again, I want to thank everybody. Uh, we were very frustrated by this audit um, as service providers, and, uh, and we hope that you'll take into consideration the, the positive effects of permanent supportive housing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. I think that um, I've also known people who I had thought had passed away because I hadn't seen them for a year or more, and then I went to a permanent supportive housing site and saw them and was real pleased. Like they were in better shape than I'd ever seen them. And um, I, I, I think that's amazing. Um, our, um, I think you're also, you're talking about how much permanent supportive housing can reduce interactions with the police. I think one of the, the, the people with, with serious mental illness have a huge it's a hugely disproportionate level of interaction with with law enforcement. Um, I you often hear people in, in the mental health field talk about saying that the that the biggest mental health provider is is the jail or or, or the prison. Um, I, I think um, actually, unfortunately, homeless shelters are another major uh, service provider for people with, with serious mental illness, and, and I, I think permanent supportive housing is, is clearly a superior alternative. It's not, not everybody needs support. There are people who have family, who have other resources. Um, but I, I think uh, for the people who need it, it it's really important. I, I, our last speaker is actually a member of the Utah State Legislature, Rep, Rep, Representative Claire Collard, and we're really grateful that you're here. I think it's important when we started, Tara, Rollins talked about um, how the how the Cal the Commission on Housing Affordability has proposed uh, two hundred million dollars be of, of the state's American Rescue Plan Act funds be dedicated to affordable housing. I, I want to make sure that I mention that that wouldn't just be for permanent supportive housing. The audit came out last week after we'd already started planning this event, and it sort of scrambled our plans a little bit because um, we we didn't we. It's just that a lot of us wanted to respond to the audit. So, um, but I think um, that there are all kinds of affordable housing. And I think it was really helpful for, for, for Tara to point out um, that in a $15 million permanent supportive housing project, the state's role, the state funding that went into that was a million dollars. And, and so you think, okay, well then it's only a million out of 15 million. Um, you know, I mean, on the one hand, it's 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 a small it's a small part of the total project, but I know people who have been working to to build projects like that. Who a million dollar gap means the project doesn't happen, right? And so it's not it it's important. I mean, it, what was frustrating about the audit was they acted like the full fifteen million dollars was coming out of the state budget, and it's really it's one fifteenth of the money. Um, but without that one fifteenth, the project doesn't happen. And so, um, and that's true, not just for permanent supportive housing, but for mixed income projects where you have, you know, 80% of the units are, are market rate and 20% are affordable to uh, people who, families that earn, you know, less than, than 40,000 a year, um, which there's a need for that too. And I, I think when you talk about, you know, wanting people to move out of permanent supportive housing, it's really hard for them to do that if there's no affordable housing, right? I mean, that's, um, and so we need, if you want, you know, so we have a huge shortage of affordable housing, generally affordable, we have a, that's why we have a housing affordability crisis. The reason we asked Representative Collar to participate is because a year, about a year ago, this, the legislature was meeting at, for, at the beginning of the, this year's legislative session. They start meeting again next month um, for their general session. And 
halfway through the session, we noticed that there was not an appropriation request on the menu for the budget uh, for, for affordable housing funding. And uh, we reached out to Representative Collard and she agreed to sponsor uh, an appropriation request that actually ultimately not just got funded, but got funded at a higher level than what she'd asked for. And so I, I think um, she's a housing hero and, uh, on the Hill. And we thought, you know, we'd ask her, I mean, um, what, what advi does she, advice does she have for, for making sure that housing doesn't get lost this legislative session that uh, begins next month? Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm honored to, to speak and share my thoughts. Uh, I, I don't know about that housing hero thing. I, I'm somewhat of a, a, a newbie to the housing uh, situation, but um, I have been very concerned about affordability of housing, um, especially you know, in Salt Lake County, where I, I live, but it's really a problem throughout the state. And you know, there's there's so many different facets to it. Um, there's there's the rising cost of of home ownership. There's the rising cost of rent. Um, there are people being pushed out of the rental market. There are people co uh, couch surfing. There are people that I personally know and have interacted with who are living in their cars or in a van, who are working full time, have full time jobs, and there that's. That's their permanent shelter. And so today, uh, this has been really informative for me because you know, I, I naively thought I understood some of the, the challenges with affordable housing, but I was not as familiar with uh, the permanent uh, supportive housing. And um, so this has been really educational for me and, and very, very helpful. So first and foremost, I, I wanna thank you for, for putting together this webinar. Um, when we, you know, we begin to look at, at permanent uh, supportive housing, I think it's important to remember that we're providing shelter for the most vulnerable population in our society. But it's, you know, it is a whole big ball of wax and it's not just one or the other. When you start talking about millions of dollars of funding, it has to be all inclusive and we have to um, include affordable housing for subsidized rental units, um, the 8020 model that you spoke about. And, um, you know, so there's, there's lots of different uh, ways to approach it. In my mind, the, um, the permanent supportive housing really kind of belongs in the healthcare, the mental health care box. And affordable housing is then in this affordable housing box where we would you know, build uh, more units. We would have access to subsidies to help people, um, you know, gain that self-sufficiency of being able to um, have their own uh, their own place to live. Um, there's there's dignity in that. We don't want everyone to be so stressed out, and and you know, we're really draw driving people. I believe out of the workforce in Salt Lake County, there's lots of talk about, um, you know, we can't fill jobs. Our unemployment rate is at 2.2%. And I think that there's a direct correlation to the fact that the cost of living and the cost of housing is so high that, you know, people are kind of throwing up their hands and, and they're exasperated and they, they go somewhere else. And so, um, it's it's a much bigger picture, but I'm I'm thrilled that you're bringing this to the forefront. And certainly, if there's whatever I can do um, to help, I'm happy to do that. I think the um, one of the biggest issues is uh, when you're you're dealing with the legislative body as a whole. There's a lack of understanding. There's certainly, you know, a, we received the audit just the other day. Um, you know, I think there's there's some confusion. People just think, oh, well, boy, this is all this money is going to um, permanent supportive housing, which is just not the case. And so we, we really need, you know, to educate everyone in the legislature and everyone really statewide about where this money is going to and specifically what they're, you know, what the bang for their buck is. What are we getting? 
Um, because ultimately, you know, everyone wants, you know, everyone's concerned with a, a prudent use of taxpayer dollars. And we, we don't want to be, I guess we want to be as transparent as possible and understand uh, where these monies are going. So that would be my um, suggestion is to continue this conversation, continue the educational process, um, however that can be done, whether it's, you know, during the session um, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll work uh, through that. Um, but I, I think if, if people are made aware, certainly if legislators are made aware and committee members are made aware of just where these monies are going and the positive outcomes that come from it, then I, I think that will go a long way in helping uh, solidify the appropriations. Okay, thank you so much. That's, um, thank you everybody. I, um, we actually are, are right at the time we thought we said we would end. Um, but I, I mean, is there anybody who, who has a question? If you raise a hand, I would, um, I'm seeing some in the chat, but I, I'm, I, if you have a question you'd like to ask, I can probably figure out how to make it so you can talk if somebody has a question. I don't, is anybody, um, I see uh, Ginger, okay, oh, Ginger Phillips, I think. Um, let me, would you, ah, uh, and, M, um, and Emily Means. I'll, so Ginger, I'll ask, have you first. Okay, am I just on audio? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, when we heard Sherry speak about um, affordable housing and um, mental health, and she also spoke about how one day in a psych unit or a receiving center um, can cost as much as a month's rent. Um, and I am wondering if there is going to be, because there is legislation that is supposed to come up in the general session by Representative Eliason about holding people for three days. And it's currently in statute to be in, in the hospital for 24 days. So this is really scary to my peers, especially my peers who do not have sustained housing or actually who can't even stay in Salt Lake County to be able to survive because of that. And I'm just wondering if there's gonna be, like, are we going to have, or is anyone gonna back legislation that is gonna give more money to community-based services and to um, affordable housing and not just locking people up and building hospitals. Um, we are here talking about um, the request for, for housing funding that we are going to collectively work to make sure is, is on the agenda during the session. Um, I would probably want to defer to somebody else. Um, I maybe Andrew has something to say about, about community-based services. Thanks, Bill. I was, just, I was just hoping that you, I was just hoping that you would have, um, could share more, any more insight with us if you have any on what the, um, on um, what the proposal coming out of the, coming out of the, the, uh, Housing task force look like looks like um, in terms of the um, in terms of um, community based community based mental health and substance use uh, support rather than facility based. I think that is a um, a conversation that we are that we are all um, that we are all trying to have and have been trying to have. Uh, Four years, so we really appreciate the uh, this forum, yet another forum, to be al allowing us to speak uh, to speak to that. I think 
in terms of in terms of um, it's going to be it's going to be difficult um, to have that conversation uh, today. I don't or this year. I don't know if um, that won't stop us. But I don't know if uh, how many of you saw uh, Robert Gerke's column in the uh, Tribune this uh, in the Tribune this morning about the staff shortages at um, the Utah State Hospital. So I'm afraid that uh, to the extent that there is a discussion of mental health um, during the session, it's largely going to be focused. Uh, it's largely going to be focused on that. Um, however, I do, um, that we, um, we are, we, this is the first step for everybody on this call um, in terms of broadening the uh, broadening uh, making the tent bigger or broadening the coalition, uh, so to speak, about um, so that we can have more have more people talking about uh, the importance of uh, of mental health at, um, as and its connect and its connection to housing and get the conversation in front of in front of more people get in in front of more committees bring more uh, bring more partners on that may uh, that have a little bit more uh, have a little bit more clout and sway than we um, than we do to uh, move the conversation in the right direction so I'm not aware of I don't know that there's going to be a whole lot of movement that we're going to be able to make this year but um, this is um, this is a, a great first step, and I think all of us are um, committed to um, pushing this conversation forward as hard as as hard and fast as we can uh, over the next couple of years. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Tara, were you going to ask say something about the the how the yes okay so. Um, my response is that I believe now that we have um, Wayne Niedehauser in the governor's office and his presentation at a commission meeting a few times ago, um, I guess like maybe a month and a half ago, you know, he, he kept saying, we need case management. We need case management. We need case management. I said, if I had a dollar every time he said that, I could go out to dinner tonight. <laughs> um, so that's a really, really good thing. Um, he also, you know, in some conversations that I've had, and I know Sherry's had additional um, in-depth conversations with him, um, he understands that homelessness is just not a housing issue. It's also a health issue and also behavioral health. And because he's, you know, higher, you know, in the governor's office, he's able to work with those people that are heading up those um, divisions and having more in-depth conversations. He's also, I know, has been working with, you know, the Huntsman um, Institution. So there's, there is a lot of movement and, and, and I think he un totally understands the need to, para you know, have, you know, um, mental health services with housing, permanent supportive housing. So um, yes, I think there will be some conversations going on. I think, you know, we also need people to come and talk at the same time when these appropriations are coming through. Um, the you know during appropriations time. Um, so we can talk about the need for both. And um, so that's my two cents. Yeah, and I mean, the, and, so the approval that was endorsed by the C Commission on Housing Affordability after, uh, after Mr. Niederhauser's uh, presentation was uh, combined two proposals. There'd been a proposal the Niederhauser had presented himself to uh, put $100 million in, in American Rescue Plan Act funding toward truly targeted affordable housing that would help people coming out of homelessness. And there was another proposal to put another 100 million toward 
um, affordable housing up to a higher income level because there's a need there too. And so the, 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 they combine that into, into one proposal. Um, and so that is, is my understanding of, of what the recommendation that came out of, of the Commission on Housing Affordability. Um, I uh, also, again, wanna say, I, I think in terms of community-based services, there is a real opportunity when the feds approve our, our waiver to include housing related services in the state Medicaid plan to uh, advocate for it for us to do that right it's it's more narrow than it needs to be when it starts but it, it can if it works well with the initial population it can be expanded so I, I think um, that's a really important thing and, and I think um, you know I mean it, it's it would be a wonderful thing if as that rolls out, we move from having a system where the, the most, most of our healthcare funding in the state is going to the state hospital and going to jails and prisons is instead going uh, through Medicaid to, uh, for community-based services. Um, and, and I, but um, our, uh, our we had, I saw that Emily Means had a question, it looked like. Um, I'm gonna give, I'll set her up to talk if I can. Um, Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily Means. I'm a reporter at KUER. Um, I have two questions. The first is, how much permanent supportive housing are you talking about statewide, and where would you like it? Um, I, that's, I think the, I have a, an answer, and then Tara can chime in. I, I, um, in terms of Salt Lake County, the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness uh, actually did a pretty uh, solid analysis of the need in Salt Lake County. And what they found is, is that we need 450 units for childless adults and uh, 150 units for, for families with children. I, I think uh, we had a, a presenter who was not able to join us today who was going to talk about the special uh, Needs, needs for supportive housing with, with families with children. I, I think um, that when we're talking about homeless mothers with children, there's often um, a really high incidence of histories of, um, of domestic violence, a, a, an alarming uh, rate for, for uh, PTSD because of that. And, and so I think the supports um, the families with kids need are, are different. Um, and, and they may not be as permanent because somebody who, who can't raise a two-year-old on her own might be able to take care of that same two-year-old on her own when that, when that two-year-old is 10, right? I mean, and so, um, because it's, um, and so I, I think, um, so that's an in Salt Lake County. Maybe, maybe Tara has, a, has an estimate for state, the statewide need. Um, I don't have an estimate. Um, we actually kind of looked at that in terms of when we were trying to support um, the request and make it a statewide um, request. And we were going off the numbers of um, children that were homeless in the school system. And so that's a, a really good number to look at. But I did want to point out the fact that we need other mechanisms um, or other tools in our tool, back, <laughs> tool belt to be able to address permanent supportive housing in um, rural areas because they don't need a hundred. And so it's really hard to compete in getting that those private um, sector dollars um, that we saw in my presentation um, because they only need maybe six units um, or, and so they can't compete. Um, and so we need to figure out a way that we can actually be able to build and have the case management um, in our rural areas. And I, I say rural, rural, because <laughs> we, we tend to think of rural as maybe Cedar City or Moab, but not some of our smaller, smaller communities. So um, I just wanted to add that. Um, I'm always plugging for rural. So um, happy to hook you up to somebody to talk about that need if you'd like. Okay. Um, that would be great. Thanks, Tara. Sorry, Representative Collard, did you have something to add? 
I have another question for you. <laughs> oh, sure. I, I was just going to echo what Tara just said. Um, you know, it's critical that we have access to these services within the communities where people live. Um, we can't expect people to all come to Salt Lake County or all come to Ogden, all go, you know, to a, a larger metropolitan area. Uh, we, we really need to have these services within the community where they reside and, and where they possibly have already some community support and they're, they're familiar with that community. They want to stay in that community. So those are, those are critical needs that we need to address. Sure. Um, Representative Pollard, I wanted to ask you, because I would guess that uh, many of your Republican colleagues probably lean toward this point that the audit makes about self-sufficiency. What kind of appetite is there among Republicans on the Hill for putting more money into permanent supportive housing? Now, that's a really difficult question for me to answer. I would say uh, there is a huge appetite for uh, funding for affordable housing. Um, I believe that it needs to, uh, permanent, permanent uh, supportive housing needs to be um, discussed more. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think we need to be very transparent in what we're actually, what we're getting the bang for our buck, what we're actually getting, um, and, and to discuss the outcomes and the very positive outcomes that come from this as opposed to uh, the thought process that it's just, you know, we're, we're supporting people and they, they are not becoming self-sufficient because that's really not my um, perception. This, this, there are portions of, of vulnerable population that are going to need this supportive housing for the rest of their lives. But there are a large number of people who can transition out of this and, with the right support and mentoring and coaching and access to the, the right services um, can become self-sufficient. So I, I think those are, those are things that we need to address and that we need to talk about and make more, uh, more of my colleagues aware of that. I could quickly uh, I, I, just add in too, Bill. Um, the majority of, um, of agencies of, of service providers that administer um, PSH programs have what's called a move on policy. And this policy um, uh, allows individuals to transition from PSH onto a housing choice voucher program or a Section 8 um, voucher. So the majority have. Um, you know, move on strategies to help individuals as they stabilize and as they become self-sufficient, move on to a less restrictive um, program mm -hmm. that opens up spots for um, additional individuals to come onto the PSH programs. I, I think that part of my goal in, in helping to organize this event was, was to help people who, have all the knowledge that we collectively have to, to start telling the stories that we have seen in, the, in our individual stories. Because I, I think that um, we have, I mean, people who work in, the, in, in, in homeless services, people who work in the housing field, people who work in the disability arena, we have all kinds of knowledge that's in our head that we don't realize isn't in everyone else's head. And I think with, with state legislators, you have really smart people who have other things that they know a lot about, but this is not usually mm -hmm. one of them. And so I think, um, I mean, what was interesting, one of the biggest successes in recent years with permanent supportive housing is in Utah County, where in like a three-year period, they were able to reduce their unsheltered homeless population by 50% by building permanent supportive housing. And I actually saw Senator Jake Andrix pitch increase, you know, uh, state funding for this project to, to a committee. And he said, you know, there, there, there are just some, there are hundred people who are just gonna need help indefinitely, right? And, and that's not, um, and you know, we can pretend they're not there, but they are, right? I mean, I, um, he said it better than that, but that's, that was the gist of it. And, and I think that, um, like it's important. I mean, that with so much of what happens in the area of homelessness, you have 
great, you have great big problems intersect with homelessness, but that aren't, that aren't actually identical, right? I mean, you have an opiate epidemic that's this big and, and it intersects with homelessness about right here, right? You have um, a mental health, you know, I mean, most people, there are more people diagnosed with schizophrenia than there are people who in the, in the United States and there are people who will become homeless this year. But does that, um, so clearly mental health overlaps, mental illness overlaps, serious mental illness overlaps with homelessness, but it's not the same thing. It's usually that plus something else. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who have a mental, a serious mental illness plus a physical disability. There are people who, uh, there, and so I, where there, there are people, I mean, I, I think when I think about this, I was as we were preparing for this, I was thinking about a friend of mine who um, he became permanently homeless when his mother passed away and his sister inherited the house, right? She, he'd been able to stay with his mom, um, but when, when his, his sister became, she wasn't, his sister wasn't as willing to deal with his issues as his mother had been, right? I, I mean, and she had kids and, and he wasn't actually bitter about it, um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think there, there's, I, I read recently that, um, like six, there was a study saying that, uh, in, in 60% of, um, of chronically homeless people are, are middle-aged in between 35 and, and 45. And I, I think that that's an age where some other supports go away. And so I, I think, you know, I mean, what we need, part of what we need to do is to say that is to be really clear that I mean permanent supportive housing it's it's a really targeted solution for a very targeted population and it is um and that's part of where I think it's useful to talk about it as a mental health service to talk about it as a phys as a healthcare service because it's not a service for everybody who shows up at the shelter everybody is there most people who show up this eight over eighty percent of the people who show up at the shelter don't, don't just not need somebody to check on on them to see if they're taking their meds. They really don't want somebody to check in on them to see if they're taking their meds because they don't have any meds, right? I mean, it's not, um, and, and so um, I think we, as, as a community, we, we know a lot and we're not sharing all of it. And, and I think, uh, I mean, it's, for me, it's really exciting to see people who, who work on disability issues as a policy, on the same screen as people who, who work on, on housing full-time and, and a state legislator. Um, just a lot of, I think we collectively, we know enough to, uh, to help to, to do a better job making our case. Make sure if, if the funding doesn't come, I wanna make sure that it's not because we didn't do our job right. Um, does, so does anybody else have any more questions? Because uh, we are, we've, we're, wow, we're over 20 minutes beyond when we were supposed to end and, and our valiant panelists are all still here despite being busy people with other things to do. Um, okay, I don't see any more questions. And so I'm, I am going to end the webinar. Thank you so much, everybody. I, I can't believe there was a question from Adam. Oh, that it was in the chat. I missed it. Uh, what is it? Uh, about the income and accessibility to housing. And I believe Andy. Yeah, I think Andy was going to answer that. I can answer that. So um, permanent supportive housing is offered to low income individuals. Um, and uh, most of the time, so the, the requirements are that the individual has to be chronically homeless, meaning that they, like Bill said, they've been homeless for one year or longer, or have had um, four episodes of homelessness in the last three years, and that they have a disabling condition. Most of the time, the individuals that come onto the program um, do not have any income when they come onto the program. And then as case managers work with those individuals um, and work towards self-sufficiency, the individual sets goals um, to gain income. That's one of the main goals that we work on individuals, uh, work with individuals on. Now, um, if once an individual does 
um, get income, they are required to pay 30% of their income as their portion of the rent. And then the housing authority um, or entity that administers permanent supportive housing covers the remainder of the rent. Um, but it is offered, there is um, an income cap and it is offered to uh, low income individuals. Does that answer your question? Okay, we'll assume yes. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. This is this is going to be an ongoing conversation. I think um, a lot, there are a lot of committed people here on this call. On this call, and I, I, we're not um, we're tenacious. We're not going to give up. Uh, permanent supportive housing is not the solution for everyone who becomes homeless, but for the people it does work for. It works better than anything else that's been studied. There is that the reason we're so enthusiastic about it is that there's nothing for people with with serious mental illness who've been homeless for over a year. There is nothing that works better. If there was something that worked better and was cheaper, we'd all be talking about that, right? I mean, it's 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 what the there isn't anything cheaper that works better. There isn't anything more expensive that works better. It works better. It's it is ju it's just the best option we have. So um, yes, it is an evidence-based practice. It is there, there and everything else. There have been lots of other things that have been studied and none of them work as well. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, and that's why we were, a lot of us were frustrated with the audit suggesting that there was something to work better. And, you know, it was really unspecific because everything that that it that could that it could be has been studied and doesn't work as well. So um, <laughs> there there are not a shortage of people around the country trying different approaches for ending homelessness. So um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we will. This is not the end of the conversation, but it was a really good start. Thank you.